Hello and welcome to the 39th CMS Pensions Lawcast. This time we're looking at matters affecting DC pension schemes and master trusts, with a particular focus on themes arising from recent consultations. I'm Joanna Clark, partner in the team, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Associate Makudi Nakanza and also Shabna Islam, who's head of DC Provider Relations at Hyman's Robertson. I'm going to kick off with a look at delivering the stronger nudge to pensions guidance. Mukudi will brief us on the open consultation on facilitating investment in illiquid assets, but which also picks up the charge cap, ERI for master trusts and DC consolidation. Shabna will then finish up by providing us with some insights into the master trust market with a focus on illiquids. So the stronger nudge. Well, back in July 2021, the DWP launched its consultation on the stronger nudge to pensions guidance. And January of this year saw the consultation response and final regulations, and these will come into force on the 1st of June 2022. The overall aim is to ensure that individuals seeking to access their flexible benefits are more strongly pushed towards using the PensionsWise free and impartial guidance service. Currently, of course, trustees are required to direct members to PensionsWise when they contact the scheme about their DC options. Trustees have to tell members that they should access the guidance and consider taking independent advice, and trustees have to tell members how they can do this. But to date, there's been no requirement to check whether members have done this, and the concern is that many are missing out on valuable information to help them make informed choices. The Stronger Nudge aims to increase the take-up of pensions guidance, with it ultimately becoming standard practice. The TPR blog compares getting pensions guidance to getting mortgage advice or a survey when buying a house and suggests that accessing your pension and getting guidance should become as much of a partnership as Ant and Deck or even Gin and Tonic. The new requirements follow successful trials and recognise that PensionsWise has had exceptional user feedback, with 94% of users either very or fairly satisfied with the service. And this is against a backdrop of only 14% of those accessing their DC DC pods actually making use of the service. And whilst it must be a good thing for people making big financial decisions to be steered towards pensions wise, what does it all mean for trustees of the pension schemes? Well, getting into the detail, the stronger nudge is engaged from the 1st of June, where a member or beneficiary makes an application to either access or transfer their flexible benefits or if there's a communication in relation to such an application. The trustees of the pension scheme must then offer to book a pensions wise guidance appointment on behalf of the member and take reasonable steps to actually book the appointment. If the member doesn't accept the offer or if the trustees can't make a convenient appointment for the member, the trustees must provide details of how the member can book the appointment themselves. The trustees have to explain that they can't proceed with the member's application unless the member has either received appropriate pensions guidance and confirmed this to the trustees or has opted out of receiving that guidance with a valid opt out notification. Trustees also have to keep records of those who've received the guidance and those who've opted out. There are some important exceptions. The stronger nudge requirements won't apply to transfer requests if the member is under the age of 50 or where the sole or main purpose of the transfer is not to access flexible benefits. So if, for example, the member or individual is just consolidating their pension pots. There is also no stronger nudge for transfers where the receiving scheme is regulated by the FCA or where the receiving trustees have already referred the beneficiary to the guidance and they've either taken it or validly opted out of the process. So those are the requirements in a nutshell. They form part of an updated disclosure regime and are supplemented by TPR guidance, which was issued in March. That guidance contains the welcome indication that it's up to trustees how they deliver the stronger nudge to their members, i.e. as long as the overall requirements are met, trustees can choose the best form of communication for their membership. There are, though, some questions in the industry on certain practical aspects. In particular, questions have been raised about how the nudge and opt out process may impact the overall timeline of a member's transfer request. For example, whilst the TPR guidance notes that it is good practice to book a pensions wise appointment as soon as possible in the process, it also suggests that trustees may want to encourage beneficiaries to take time to fully consider any opt out decision. There are also questions about the impact of the new requirements with the statutory right to transfer 
um, because the nudge requirements don't expressly override the statutory rights. We've also seen questions raised about how trustees can determine the purpose of a transfer, i.e. is the main or sole purpose to access flexible benefits. So clearly there are still some interesting issues to resolve. For now though, the immediate action is for trustees to consider the format of their nudge materials and liaise with their administration teams on scheme literature in order to make sure they've got a process in place ahead of the 1st of June. And with that, I'll turn to Makudi. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, the book, so the consultation published on the 30th of March this year focuses on four areas. The first area is around the charge cap reform. And currently trustees of DC schemes are subject to the charge cap, which is set at 0.75% of funds under management in a default arrangement. The cap applies to all investment admin charges, excluding transaction costs and other charges. The drawback here is that it prevents trustees from accessing investments such as infrastructure projects and venture capital, which are areas where the government wants to encourage investment. These are higher risk endeavors and tend to attract performance fees. The charge cap can hence be called a double-edged sword because it protects members from excessive fees and simultaneously excludes them from potentially higher value opportunities. The DWP's proposal is a charge cap that excludes performance fees to be payable only when fund managers exceed pre-agreed targets. While the financial sector supports the proposal, some master trusts, for example, are ambivalent, and the DWP has expressed has recognized that the proposed change was, was not positively received across the pension sector. Despite market reticence, the DWP intends to move forward with further consultation, which is likely to include new rules on disclosing details of performance fees. However, barriers such as the lack of accessible products, expertise, and appropriate pricing models remain and need addressing. The second area the consultation focused on was around employer-related investments, or ERIs, in authorized master trusts, and restrictions against these were introduced to prevent the misappropriation of scheme assets by restricting the degree to which a scheme could invest member funds in its sponsoring employer. It was also to create a separation between a scheme and an employer to prevent the failure of the latter directly affecting the former. The pensions market has evolved since these rules were made, and for DC master trusts, they present a problem because master trusts are used by many unconnected employers. Even though those employers operate at arm's length to the scheme and there is a negligible risk of them influencing a scheme's investment policies, master trusts spend time and money complying with rules that are incompatible with their structure, and the rules also limit the pool of asset classes in which they can invest. The DWP has recognized this and intends to allow more asset classes for master trusts to consider. For authorized master trusts with 500 or more employers, the reform is that ERI restrictions will only apply to one, the scheme funder, which is the person or entity that funds the master trust, two, the scheme strategist, which is the person or entity that makes decisions about the master trust's commercial activities, and persons connect, connected with the scheme funder or scheme strategist. Of the 36 master trusts currently authorized by the pensions regulator, data, their data indicates that 13 of them are within the scope of having 500 or more employers. Thus, given the gap between master trusts of this size and those with less than 500 employers, the DWP has decided that 500 would be the appropriate place to set the threshold to avoid schemes falling in and out of the scope of their proposals if their number of employers fluctuates. The third area the consultations focused on was around further DC scheme consolidation, and the DWP has clarified that it wants further DC consolidation among schemes with assets less than 100 million pounds. The aim is that over time, the number of smaller individual schemes will reduce as they continue to merge or be acquired by larger schemes. With rising administration costs in the pensions market and concerns over members in poorly performing schemes, the rationale behind the drive for consolidation is that it will bring costs down through economies of scale, improve governance standards, and generate more value for members across the board. Caution, however, has been expressed over the rush to consolidate and responses to the consultation suggest more work should be done to, to assess the impact that this will have on schemes. Some fear that delivering a bespoke tailored service to members will become more onerous with increases in size which could ultimately lead to lower member engagement and satisfaction over time, as the service becomes standardized to meet demand. There have also been worries that a, consul that a consolidation of master trusts will lead to increased pressure on capacity, 
with too few providers unable to meet the market's needs, as most schemes look to transfer into a master trust in the short and medium term. The government has confirmed that it will not be introducing any new regulations to further consolidate the DC market in 2022, but will work with the pensions regulator to monitor the impact of the new value for members assessments, which will start to be produced this year by trustees. And the final area the consultation focused on was around the disclosure and explain the disclosure and, ex and explanation approach to trust to trustees for their illiquid investments. And in this regard, the DWP has proposed an amendment to the statement of investment principle requirements to include a duty for trustees of DC schemes to disclose and explain their policies on illiquid investment. Related to this, the DWP has also made an additional proposal that requires DC schemes to publicly disclose their asset allocation in their annual chair statement. The DWP wants to promote diversification and investment in new areas that could bring higher returns for members. Thus, by changing regulations and issuing new guidance, the DWP are telling trustees that illiquid assets are viable options and that the new yardstick scheme should use to assess where they place in the market should be net returns and not cost. Trustees, however, will not be forced to invest in specific asset classes because of the implications that this would have on their statutory duties, one of which is that they maintain their independence. The DWP points to places where similar practices are followed, such as Australia, where funds publicly disclose their asset class allocations. However, they note that the requirements will not be as invasive as those down under, where funds are required to report each of their assets' identities, values, and weighting. From what we can gather, the approach that will be suggested to trustees will build off current practices followed by master trusts, as some already voluntarily report their asset allocation uh, data through what's called the Corporate Advisor Pensions Average, or CAPA. The data master trusts provide form part of the corporate advisors master trust and group personal pension default report. And this report tracks the performance of a range of asset invested in by schemes, as well as the varying methodologies and technology asset managers deploy to generate their returns. And with that, I'll hand over to Shagna. Kim Akudi. Now, in terms of the master trust market, we've seen a significant growth in the size of master trusts over recent years. Assets under management now at around £110 billion in total. And one of the benefits of this scale is it gives rise to opportunities. The opportunity to invest in a wider range of investments and non-traditional assets, such as illiquids. Now, is it worth investing in illiquids? I believe so. With an allocation to illiquids, we can confidently say it improves members' retirement outcomes. That's net of charges over the longer term. And that's through higher expected investment returns, improved diversification of assets and alignment with climate goals. And we're already seeing some of the largest master trusts investing in illiquids. Nest, for example, the largest master trust at £23 billion, has committed to allocating 15% of its default investment fund to illiquids, making a real impact to its 10 million members. We also have Smart and Cushion Master Trusts, both already have exposure towards illiquids. However, investing in illiquids is uncommon across the more traditional master trust providers. Why is that? Investing in illiquids can have its challenges. There's usually a higher member fund charge and the supply of these assets can be limited. But we at Hymans Robertson are tackling these myths. Given, some, given that some providers have incorporated illiquid assets already, it is possible to overcome these challenges. For example, we're seeing average member charges for DC schemes is around 0.3% or 0.4%. So there's room to allocate assets to more expensive funds, but keep within the current charge cap of 0.75%. The recent co consultation also indicates the intention to remove some of the barriers to making investing in illiquids more cost effective. Now, in terms of access to illiquids, this can be done through blended or pooled funds, which some providers have already implemented. I do have some more recent insights from speaking to the key master trust providers. Now, illiquids are certainly high up on the master trust trustee agenda. That's to incorporate illiquid assets within their default investment funds. 
So we expect to see the Master Trust market benchmark on this particular feature to change over the coming 12 to 18 months. And where do I expect this to move towards? I expect the market to settle to somewhere around 20% allocation to liquids. And that's in the growth phase of the default glide path. But there could be some ambitious providers that push this further to around 40%. This also highlights that when you pick a master trust provider to look after your employees' pension savings, it's important to assess their services and offerings today, but also how this will, will develop in the future. Will they remain ahead of the market or is there a risk they could fall behind the market? What are the drawbacks? The main one is realising capital to meet the benefit payments due to individual members. That's on transfer or withdrawal or it can be on bulk transfer to another master trust. For individual benefit payments, we are typically seeing drawdown levels of around 5% per annum of assets. These benefit payments can simply be, be met by capital and income payments from the underlying investments. For bulk transfer or wall members' assets, where we are seeing a growing activity in that secondary master trust market, where employers are moving all their members from one master trust to another, that's where full withdrawal or liquidation of assets may not be possible for that bulk transfer. But this is where regulatory change is needed to require the receiving master trust to accept the incoming transfers of illiquid assets. And that could be through re-registration of assets, making that whole process simpler to manage and re whilst retaining competition in the master trust market. So overall, it's important to review your investment beliefs around illiquid assets and assess how they can improve retirement outcomes for members. Now, liquids may not be suitable for all, but with the recent consultation, it's likely there will be a requirement to disclose and explain the allocation for some larger DC, masters, DC schemes, including master trusts. Those were my insights into the master trust market. Back to Joanna. Thanks, Shabna, and thanks everyone for joining us on this lawcast. Uh, hopefully some interesting nuggets and food for thought for you. Uh, do please get in touch with one of us or your usual CMS contact if you have any questions. Thanks very much. Bye.